There are many people we might consider to be part of the common school movement. People who thought that a uniform, state-supported school system open to all was vital to the health and well-being of American society. The most influential were the champions of reform who lobbied state legislators, wrote detailed reports, and traveled to far-flung realms, who scoured the countryside to observe schools and build allies. And most of these people were men who had grown up in the early republic of the United States. They often came from middling stations in life, and education had vaulted their prospects in what had been a country of yeoman settlers, but was increasingly organized around trade rather than subsistence farming. Few of them were actual teachers, though at least many of them had some brief experiences in the classroom. They were, in short, native-born, middle-class Protestants who thought their values should be the values of the nation. Indeed, who thought that unless their values were the values of the nation, the country might come apart at its seams. Because you have to remember, the United States of the 1830s was still only an experiment in democracy, one that many observers worldwide thought doomed to failure. America was a generation removed from a revolution. The Founding Fathers were so afraid of mob rule that states initially restricted voting rights only to those with property. But as Jacksonian democracy swept the nation, state legislators extended the franchise to all white men, regardless of property. The education reformers, by and large, came from the political advantage that this was a dangerous development. Though they weren't trying to turn back the clock to some agrarian yesteryear. They wanted to find a way to keep the material benefits that came from the growing division of labor while reducing the social chaos it seemed to unleash. Generally, they aligned with the Whig Party. Now, every state had a strong cluster of education reformers who communicated not only by individual correspondence, but through publications such as the Common School Journal or state-specific journals for education. We could talk about Henry Barnard in Connecticut, John Pierce of Michigan, William Seward of New York, or Calvin Wiley of North Carolina. We could talk about Catherine Beecher, a fascinating and complicated figure in 19th century women's history. But the first among peers among the common school reformers was Horace Mann of Massachusetts. So let's take his measure. Mann was born in 1796, back when George Washington was still president in the United States. Mann was the son of a Massachusetts farmer. And as was usual at the time, he only went to school about six weeks a year during the winter time. Boys would typically go in between harvest and planting seasons, while the girls would usually go during the summertime. Horace Mann managed to go to Brown University in nearby Rhode Island, and he graduated as valedictorian in 1819. After some legal training, Mann was elected to the state legislature of Massachusetts in 1827, and he championed a variety of social reforms. Asylums, temperance, the elimination of lotteries, but the chief among these was school reform. He helped convince fellow legislators to create a state board of education and he got himself appointed state superintendent in 1837, a position he held for 12 years. It was the bully pulpit he needed to promote the common school reform program, and he founded and edited the common school journal to proselytize to a broader community across the nation. Always on the lookout for good ideas, Horace Mann crossed the Atlantic in 1843 to observe firsthand the much talked about Prussian education system and steal the best attributes for the system in Massachusetts. After a few years in the House of Representatives, Mann was appointed president of Antioch College in Ohio, which he held until his death just before the Civil War. Mann is but one of hundreds of like-minded reformers. They weren't all equally religious, but they all fit into big tent Protestantism. They had middle-class enthusiasm for hard work, self-improvement, and the separate spheres for men and women. They all believed in something like capitalism, although that wasn't a word then in wide circulation. Perhaps above all, they wanted to make democracy sustainable in America. And given the circumstances of the 1830s, they thought education was the way to get it done. Now, let's take a closer look at the specifics of the common school reforms that they advocated and the underlying problems with American education at that time. 